Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Book Trib Live Chat. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today the very fabulous Holly Robinson, author of The Idea of Him, which is out today. Uh, as many of you know, Holly is a New York Times bestselling author of The Manny. Um, and Leslie Stahl says that The Idea of Him is unput downable. Um, and Ellen Hildebrand says that the book is a coming of age book for grown ups. It's fast paced and intriguing, glamorous and real. Um, and Holly's a woman of many talents. She was an Emmy Award winning uh, producer for ABC News, uh, where she spent more than a decade covering global politics. And her writing has been published in the New York Times, Newsweek, Talk, uh, Daily Beast, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and many others. Uh, today we are giving away copies of the idea of him on Book Trip. So after the chat, head over to booktrip.com to enter to win. And also please remember to sign up at Book Trip to get the latest on live chats, giveaways, original content, and more. So without further ado, please help me welcome Holly Peterson. Holly, excuse me, um, Holly Robinson. Peterson. Excuse me. Um, so without further ado, please help me welcome Holly Robinson. Holly, thanks so much and happy Pub Day. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Sam. I'm really excited. Oh, excellent. So before we get rolling with the viewer questions, can you tell me a little bit of the about the idea of him? You know, I really wanted to write a very fast paced work of social satire. And I hope the idea of him is that I feel like we live in this ADD culture where we can't really focus on anything. And I, for one, need literature that moves quickly and that has a lot of action and is saying a lot and is, you know, pretty deep. And I tried to write a book about love, about why we get into relationships and about how hard it is to get out of them once we're kind of stuck in them and the fears we have right. of being on our own. So the book is a work of social satire, but it's also a romantic and complicated look at, at the reality mm -hmm. of relationships. Now, um, why did you decide to make the jump from TV and print news to becoming you know, a novelist? Well, I'll tell you, I wrote an article for the New York Times about my Manny, and I wrote it a lot about all the money that was happening on the Upper East Side around the year 2005. And I'm a journalist. I don't write things that aren't true, even when I'm writing novels, in the sense that if I'm portraying a scene or trying to explain how a certain society works or how a city moves, you know, I do it mm -hmm. with a lot of accuracy. I would never write something that wasn't real, and I would never exaggerate something. And, um, you know, so the, the move from nonfiction to fiction was really not very difficult for me because my books, I feel like, are, are very reality-based. Fiction. I'm writing mm -hmm. about what New York is like right now, and a certain sector of New York is like right now, post crash. In the case of my second novel, The Idea of Him. And so the mm -hmm. switch to fiction, while it was liberating because you can create characters, um, it still feels like the same craft of explaining something and explaining it well and accurately, which is what journalism is, of course, meant to be. Mm -hmm. Now, Lacey says the idea of him is extremely relatable in terms of a woman confronting her deepest fears and trying to prevail. Uh, did you have the relatability factor in mind while writing this? Of course I did. I mean, if I'm, if I'm writing a character, I think it's really important that people understand that character. I mean, you can relate to Tony Soprano. I mean, he was one of the greatest characters mm -hmm. ever created. Um, and people related to his fears and his neuroses and his depressions and his love for his family and his, you know, desire to be more and more successful and to have more. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he may have been doing things illegally and murdering people in the process, but there was a deep part of his psyche that was very relatable. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think women have so much in common in this country in the sense that we're all working so hard on so many fronts at the same time. And both protagonists in both my novels are women who are kind of outsiders who've been launched into this new kind of scary situation in a new environment and working hard, raising kids, struggling with husbands who are often difficult, no matter if you love them very much, and trying mm -hmm. to make it all work. And I wanted to make that relatable. Yes. And I think so many women are like that in the sense that we're all working hard whether we're quote unquote stay at home moms and working hard at keeping our families safe and happy and healthy or at jobs and working half time or working full time. We're all really busy women. We're mm -hmm. earnestly trying hard to do our best in all ways. And so 
that's her the main character is she's she's really trying to find happiness but she's also trying to do her best at everything all the time mm -hmm. and people seem to really you know resonate with your characters and the manny and everything as well um and faces what makes your character so likable i mean do they have a particular it factor i think partially you answered that before by saying that they're simply relatable um, they're realistic and, uh, you know, the, their struggles are um, somewhat universal. But what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want anyone to read any dialogue or any scene in my book and say, oh, she would never say that. That wouldn't happen. Right. You know, that's that's what really turns me off of books and TV shows and movies. Like, oh, come on, she would never go for this guy if he did this or she would never put up with this or where's her, you know, you don't you don't want to not like people in the sense that you don't believe them. Once you believe them, then you can relate to them. And I think the key to good novel writing is having characters who really express themselves really clearly and express their fears and are kind of off on the edge of some precipice or some ledge where they're really going out there and trying to explain to the reader how scared they are, how nervous they are, how excited they are, or how naughty they feel. I mean, if you can really make your characters explain their deepest, darkest feelings that are really propelling them to act and behave, then I think, I think you're doing a good job. And that's really certainly what I try to do. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Jessica wants to know a little bit more about your process. She says, how often do you write? Do you have a schedule where you have a, you know, you have to write at least five pages a day uh, or something similar? Yeah, I mean, everybody's really different about this. I know a lot of famous writers will tell you to write every day because writing is a muscle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like saying, eat your vegetables and your fruits and 1,200 calories and work out every day. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's a great um, idea, but no one's actually going to do that. No one's going to write every day. Weeks and weeks go by, and I can't write because I'm so sick of it, mm -hmm. or I don't know how to fix it, or I'm launching on another project. I think the most important thing is to find quiet time where your emails from the cable TV guy and your children and your husband and the schools are not bothering you. Because the problem with emails and the culture that we have now is there are, many of them are very important and they're completely disruptive to mm -hmm. our thought process. The most important thing if you want to be a writer and if you want to write successfully is either what, do what I do, is I get up really, really early in the morning, like 4.30 or 5, and I write for two and a half solid hours before I wake my mm -hmm. kids up. Or I start drinking Diet Cokes at dinner and I start really writing from 9.30 to midnight. But those are the hours when you're not bothered by other people and you're not bothered by emails and you don't need to buy plane tickets before the sale goes away and you don't need to talk to a teacher and you don't need to order from Fresh Direct and you don't need to yell at some cable TV guy. Those are the hours where you can put all that noise outside your head and focus on your writing because writing, it, it's like when I'm writing really hard, my brain hurts. And you've got to get yourself to that level of total and full concentration in order to express what you're feeling and put it on the page. And that's the biggest advice I have for everyone. When you write, go sit somewhere by yourself and put your iPhone in the other corner of the room on mute. Mm -hmm. Almost like a meditative practice. It is. I mean, there's a program I have on my computer called Mac Freedom, which mm -hmm. puts you off the internet for an hour. And I tend to do that in 55 minute hits. And then I allow myself five minutes for important emails. And then I go back onto it. So I know I'm going to get to my emails, but I know that I can't touch them and can't reach for them while I'm trying to reach for a word that I can't find. It just kind of makes my brain dig deeper if I know there's no other option but to continue to concentrate. Well, Jules wants to know, um, you know, including editing and revisions about how long it takes you to write a book. Oh my God, it's so hard to write books. I mean, sometimes you can take, sometimes it can come quickly if you have a clear thing in your head that you really want to say. And then sometimes mm -hmm. it just takes years. And William Styron, one of the great writers of our, you know, last century, got completely depressed and wrote about his depression over his inability to finish books. It took seven, eight, nine years. So even the greatest writers can't finish their books. But, um, it depends on the book is all I can say. The most important thing is that you write what you believe, that you mm -hmm. have a really clear idea of what you want to say, and you really try to stay focused on that is, is the advice I would give. Don't get off on too many weird tangents about other areas or weird characters or subplot lines. Try to focus on one plot line, one narrative, and 
you know, anywhere from two to four to five characters and no more. It's a great advice. Um, Jillian says that you're, as we discussed, you know, you're a former producer for ABC News and Newsweek reporter. Do you ever miss wearing that journalist hat? I completely miss journalism. I still write for magazines sometimes. I don't produce for ABC News anymore. But that is my passion, to be a journalist and to be a television producer, because I like meeting people. I like traveling the world. I like trying to understand new people and beliefs and ideas and, and concepts and political regimes. And I can't do that as much anymore when I'm writing novels. But the reason that I'm not doing that so much anymore is, frankly, because I got divorced about four or five mm -hmm. years ago. And I have three children. And about 94% of the time, I am disciplining them and raising them and making sure everything's okay with them. So I can't any longer have a job that requires me to be at the office from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. like I used to. When you write mm -hmm. novels, your time is your own. So I can work like a dog still, but I do it on my own time. So that kind of mm -hmm. after school, 5 to 9, I can be sure to be home. And with a divorce... But, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to be able to be home at those hours. And so that's why I don't have a quote unquote real job. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Lacey says again, you know, award winning producer, uh, best selling author. Is there anything that you can't do? Uh, no, really. What are some activities that you don't like and you do like more importantly? Well, for leisure time, I'm. I'm very sporty, but I'm not necessarily good at things. I'm completely terrified of horses. I um, I don't like camping. I'm very scared of bears for some bizarre reason. Um, <laughs> I like to play tennis. I surf a lot. I'm not very good, but I took it up about four years ago. And, um, you know, I don't know if I'm someone who's good at money things or numbers things or really focusing on legal briefs. I mean, there's a lot of things I can't do well. I think that my attention span is not enormous. Um, in the mm -hmm. sense that if I'm bored, it's very hard for me to stick with something. And that's why in my book, The Idea of Him, I really think that it is absolutely jam-packed with action. The woman's got three men swirling around her. She can't decide which one she's mm -hmm. going to sleep with, which one she's not going to sleep with, which, which one she's going to end up with. There's a huge legal plot going on. So, I mean, I'm not good at things that require calm and patience. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I think I'm a good TV producer. And that's why I'm hopefully good at writing books that, that have a lot of energy and action because that, that's what I feel I need. I'm not very comp contemplative and, um, you know, quiet as a personality. So I can't do work mm -hmm. that requires that. I understand that. Um, Frankie says that she really enjoyed the Manny and she's looking forward to reading uh, the new one as well. And she says that Manny received a lot of buzz and success. And did you feel it added pressure to make this novel uh, the idea of him a hit? You know, there's two kinds of hits in life. I mean, I would love this book to sell like crazy, like the Manny did. And I hope it does. I think that this book is a better book. And I think that it's deeper and I think it's more profound in the sense that it speaks to women's greatest fears. And I think that we all fear being on our own. We all fear not being in a relationship. We all are worried mm -hmm. that we're possibly with the wrong person. Sometimes we really are with the wrong person and sometimes we're just being neurotic and nervous for no reason. But for those of us mm -hmm. that have been in relationships when they're not working out, it's a very unsettling, anxiety-provoking time because you kind of know something's wrong and you know you need mm -hmm. to make a step and you know you need to move on. But taking that step of being on our own and not being with a mate is just totally unnatural. We want a boyfriend. We want a guy around. We mm -hmm. want to go to the movies with them. We don't want Saturday nights alone, whether you're in your 20s, you're married, or whatever age you're at. And kind of facing that fear and getting up the strength to realize that you have your work passions, you have your cult, you know, your artistic passions, you have your friends, you have your children, you have all kinds of endeavors that you're interested in, and that for a year or two or two months or three years or whatever it's going to be, all that stuff is going to be enough to fulfill you. And you don't need to kind of cling to the next life raft in the form of another wrong man to quote unquote make it. And that's why I didn't want to write another book about you know, getting the guy as the prize, as so many romantic comedies in Hollywood are, and so many of these kind of quote-unquote silly chiclet books are, you know, in the sense mm -hmm. that they're just trying to get the guy, and then they get the guy, and oh, you, everything's okay for that woman. 
I really didn't want to write that book where sending the message that being with a man means you're okay. She's going to be with a man. She's got a lot of men around her. She's considering them all. But her journey, and I kind of hate that word journey, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> her journey is trying to figure out how she's going to be happy with herself and how she's going to be fulfilled in her passion and how she's not going to obsess over all these men and how she's going to relax and calm down and find gratefulness for everything she has in her life and to move slowly and deliberately through her life, which is something I think all of us need to do when a relationship isn't quite working out. We need to take a breath and realize we have ourselves and we're just fine and we don't need to be with a man who either isn't treating us well or not making us feel good or who bores us to tears. We're good on our own. We're good. We're fine. Mm -hmm. We've got friends, we've got family, we've got passions, we're going to be fine. And that's kind of the message in the book. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying the book isn't romantic and there isn't lots of sex and lots of good juicy men stuff in the book, but I think the underlying theme is one of a woman who's learning to trust herself, to feel strong about herself and not grasping for the next available man. So I really did want to write that book. Really important for points, reason, definitely. I, it's more profound than the man. I mean, I think it's a deeper and more important book. I really do. Now, Allie, the main character in the book, she is high powered PR executive um, and she's got some she's got some younger kids and she has all this going on. Is it kind of based on, on, on your um, you know, on, on you a little bit as, you know, a news producer and writer and all this, you know, along with some children of your own and everything like that. I mean, what woman isn't nuts all day? So it's based on everyone. True. Oh, trying <laughs> to juggle cupcakes and doctor's appointments and sick kids and sick family members and elderly parents and housing issues and your job and your friends and your friend's boyfriend or just woke up with your friend and you know, we're all so terribly busy all the time and we're trying to manage and juggle and handle it all. And Allie, in my book, the idea of him is very much trying to juggle a job, a difficult demanding mm. sick husband and two very needy kids. And I hopefully I portrayed that with humor and relatability and and a lot of reality because I certainly feel that way every day where I look at my day and say, holy moly, I can't possibly mm. get everything done I need to get done today. Mm -hmm. Now, Erin uh, has a question. She says, when, when did you establish the Holly Peterson Foundation and has it been a huge undertaking in addition to family life and writing? I established it about three years ago. Um, I took some of the funds that I made from the Manny and put into it. And to be very honest with people, I have a father who made a fair amount of money in his lifetime. He started out as a Greek immigrant. Uh, with nothing in a restaurant that was open for 27 years, 24 hours a day. And he went to business school and he had a big career in the government and, and in business. And he really believes that giving away money and helping others is the most important legacy he can give to us. So he has helped us set up foundations so that we are able to do that. He wants us very, very seriously to spend a great deal of our time and energy giving money away and helping people and giving back because we've certainly been very fortunate in our lives. And so he helped me set it up. I added to it and we really focus on inner city issues in my foundation and girls' mm -hmm. education overseas because I spent a fair amount of time studying girls and women overseas and learning mm -hmm. that if you can educate the girls and help the mothers start businesses in all those seriously impoverished nations, the entire country benefits because those women are so poorly treated and they have no rights mm -hmm. and they have no abilities and no access to anything. So if you can give them just two years of school or a little bit of access to health care and education and know how, it literally changes the landscape of the entire country and the GDP of the country goes up. And so I've studied that a fair amount. And so programs that help women and girls overseas, I work with and also inner city programs, especially in New York, I, I help with. That's wonderful. What's the website for the foundation? I don't have a website or a foundation. Oh, you don't have a website? I don't want to get a million grants, but we, we focus on inner city, inner city education mostly in this country. Great. Wonderful. Um, Savvy Bookworm wants to know how often you use social media and whether it helps you connect with your fans. 
That is the absolute most interesting question of my day today with my book launch. I am a journalist. I worked at magazines. I worked in network news for Diane Sawyer. I have an immense amount of contacts at Vogue and the New York Times and all these places. With my last book, there was a lot of publicity in traditional media that helped launch it. This time, it seems that the press in this country is so focused on tabloid news and so kind of nervous about what their next piece is and where their next audience is, mm. that they're a little bit frightened to cover fiction and books. And so there's actually much less coverage, unfortunately, of literature on television and in magazines, I find. And so I've had to go to the web for wonderful places mm. like you all. And I think that right now I'm certainly connecting with people and I hope that they you know, enjoy this conversation and think about buying my book and getting in touch with me and, and connecting with me. But I think that this whole Twitter universe of just tweeting out my Amazon link or my independent bookstore link and Facebook liking and I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not sure it isn't kind of a big vast black void that doesn't connect people that much and it doesn't just pass by people. I think talking and writing and doing what we're doing now is the way to connect with people. And I don't think they really care what I'm tweeting. But we'll see. See what's happening. Mm, definitely. <laughs> Andrea wants to know whether you get emotional when you finish a book and have to say goodbye to the characters you've created. You want to, as a writer, you want to go over and change things all the time. And my editor had to literally tear it out of my hand. <laughs> I remember I was sitting in my car, pulling out pages, changing chapter headings, you know, mm -hmm. until the very last minute. And she wouldn't even let me change like three of them, and I was so upset. So. I mean, it's really, really hard to give something up. It was 480 pages at one point, and now it's about 330 pages. But there's no way you're not fully attached to, to characters. And saying goodbye is really hard. But I think that they're unresolved issues. I can explore new books. So I am mm -hmm. continuing. Good. Um, Lana wants to know what your favorite part is about being an author. Um, you know, is it the, that you get to set your own schedule for the most part? Um, you know, is it when the first book first comes out today, for instance? I'm definitely really lucky to be able to set my own schedule. So my priority is the emotional health of my children, having been through a divorce and having these children at these very tender ages. I call it soul creation in the sense that the people they're becoming is happening mm -hmm. before my eyes and making sure they're not spoiled and making sure they're nice to people and making sure they feel good about themselves and have confidence is the most important thing I do every day. And the fact that I can write from 4 to 8 a.m. or 9 p.m. to midnight and focus on that from 5 mm -hmm. to 9 or 5 to 10 when they're home is really my favorite part about being an author because it allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'd say that I just think the exercise of really getting into your brain and, and concentrating on something that you don't quite think you can do is a very satisfying thing to do. And I think it's scary. And I think you feel completely stupid half the time and you're embarrassed about what you put on a page compared to all these wonderful writers out there and think oh, it's never going to be anything like them. But it's still kind of exciting to kind of expose yourself that way and try really hard and try your best at something. So I'd say those mm -hmm. are the two reasons I like being an author. Now, going back to the idea of him, Jessica says uh, that many people fall in love with the idea of the perfect man, but not necessarily the man himself. Uh, why do you think our society is so obsessed with finding the one? I think that, I mean, I personally have done that about a hundred times. I mean, I can't really think of a relationship where I haven't done that. I get totally hooked on a thing, an idea, mm -hmm. like long hair or a French accent or some super naughty guy in high school who did all kinds of things he shouldn't have been doing, but got amazing grades. And I thought that was so cool that he was such a rebel. Or, you know, I married a man who was intensely responsible and competent. And I thought, well, this is, this is the idea of the husband I'm supposed to have. But I don't think it means you're really messed up if you do that. I think it's a very mm -hmm. natural thing to get excited about something about someone. And I, I think I'm someone who gets a little overly excited about things, about people. <laughs> I get, you know, all excited that they have long hair or they're cool or they speak French or yeah. they're this or they're that. And, and I think that can be really dangerous when you're trying to get into relationships because the only thing that matters in a relationship is that you have really intense intimacy with the person and that you 
feel comfortable telling them your deepest, darkest feelings and that you can open up to them and feel really safe with them when hard things are going on in your life or when happy things are going on in your life. That's all that matters. The hair, the accent, and the money, the competence, you know, none of that stuff matters. All that matters is can you fully relate to this person? And I think that so many of us fall for the idea of someone and it's just this amazing phenomenon. Whenever I talk about the title of this book, everyone says, oh my God, I did that so many times. Because what happens is, is you get into the relationship with this person and then suddenly you're sitting at dinner and you think, I don't even know if I like this person, literally. Like, I don't mm. even know if I like you. I just got so excited about your hair and your accent and your clothes and your coolness that I don't even know if I like you, you know? And when you realize that, it's, it's really disorienting and it's scary because then you think, oh God, now I have to break up and oh God, now I have to be on my own and oh God, I'm so messed up that I fell for you and why did mm. I fall for you? And it kind of just send your mind into this huge tizzy. And that's certainly what the main character in my book is doing. She kind of falls for the idea of everybody around her. And uh, then she tries to cope and kind of settle down. And that's certainly something I need to do. And that's something that <laughs> that's, that's a mistake I've made many times in my life. Hmm. Now, Jules wants to know what you're working on next. Are you staying in the same genre as the idea of him? I think all my books are going to be really fast paced. I think there's going to be a lot of action in them. I hope Leslie Stahl, who's the anchor of 60 Minutes, read my book and she mm -hmm. said it was unput downable. I, I'm hoping yeah, that all my books will be like that because I am not by any mm -hmm. means a literary giant and I'm never going to write these long 40 page treatises on fields and the beauty of life. I'm going to write books filled with intrigue and action that are going to keep you guessing like crazy at the end of every chapter. And so I will be writing that genre. And I think that I have to write about love because what's more important than mm -hmm. relationships and sex and who you like and who you don't like and all that stuff. So I, I, they'll say, they, yes, they'll be the same genre. I mean, I may add a murder here and there, but if they're going to be about women <laughs> figuring out their lives and, and hopefully getting stronger in the process. Definitely. Well, Holly, thank you so much for joining us today. And everyone who's watching, you know, you can enter to win a book on booktrip.com and you can also go to your local independent bookseller, um, and, you know, and, and pick a copy up there. Uh, you can find out more about Holly Peterson. <laughs> I got it right this time at hollypeterson.com. Um, and just want to say thanks again and best of luck. The idea of him is a fabulous book and uh, we wish you all the best. Okay. Thank you all. And please visit my website. I'll answer back. Thank you. Thanks.